Hello, my name is Peter Essany. I'm a visual effects supervisor and creative director living and working in London. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to talk about how I use Cinema 4D, how I approach certain things and how I try to sort some problems out with the help of Cinema 4D. And I'm going to do that through two projects. Uh, the first one is the Dark Crystal series prologue that I did last year for Netflix. And the second one is a self-initiated project that I did through the first couple of weeks of the lockdown here in London. Before we dive into the details, before we go into the world of keyframes and volumes and settings and whatnot, I would recommend taking a look at my showreel. Hopefully that gives you a bit more context about the work I usually do and gives you an idea about how I approach certain issues and, and, and how I tackle certain problems. So as I mentioned, um, Cinema 4D is pretty much the uh, tool that we use all the time on uh, smaller and larger projects as well. And um, one of the um, more design-oriented projects that I was involved with uh, was Blade Runner 2049. I'm very quickly just going to show you something that um, sort of like is similar to how that project was made, just to give you an example of how simple things could be used to create quite a lot of complexity. Now, one of the tasks uh, there was to create some sort of a scanner, uh, an optical scanner that um, scans an object and, and uh, does all sorts of things. So the idea that I had was to have this optical device that's similar to those rotating lenses that you have in front of your eyes when you go to the uh, doctor to check your eyesight. and. Um, I wanted to create a combination of these lenses and the way they shift and move would create some some sort of interesting uh, interaction with the object that's being scanned. Um, and before that, we usually do the, the, the same steps, come up with an idea, um, do some sketches on paper, and then as soon as it's possible, uh, uh, we dive into Cinema 4D and see where we are. So what you have here is essentially a very 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 simple setup it, it has a kind of like basic uh, polygonal object that's sort of like uh, um, a subdivided uh, mesh that I modeled and um, then I used uh, a cinema for the primitive which is the um, it's, at? it's the uh, oil tank primitive and uh, I made it editable and then uh, rescaled it because it has that built-in kind of like curvature that I immediately um, wanted to use uh, because I did not want to spend too much time on modeling something bespoke. So um, that's a very important thing to use as much uh, from your library or, or, or pre-made assets as you can, especially in the early stages of the project to get the ideas out very quickly. So. Then I created a, a set of materials that are essentially uh, playing with refractions. So all sorts of uh, glass materials with, with, with different types of uh, different IORs, essentially. And um, the idea was that the interaction of these is going to create some sort of cool stuff. Um, then I had this subject, which... Uh, in this case, is an image of a jellyfish, and uh, I made this material kind of like translucent. So um, I wanted to put some lights behind it so it shines through. 
and then I set up very quick animation of, um, of these optical kind of like arrays if you will that move in front of a camera that's just set up like this and you know maybe we can get a little bit closer let's see like this so let's do a quick test render how it looks and uh, essentially it, it shows nothing and the reason for that is no redshift lights are set up so what I did is I chugged an area light underneath oops which is this one and uh, I play with this size essentially uh, maybe we can we can move it out a little bit further just a little bit more spread um, you can play with the intensity you can play with sort of like uh, the color and all sorts of things like that and then I created an array with a cloner of uh, similar area lights that go around the edges and illuminate that a little bit so you can see that they are positioned around the edges of that uh, optical disk Better. and then um, I throw in kind of like an environment a redshift environment to uh, create some sort of sense of volume volumetric light uh, that's absolutely not necessary it's just sort of like up to you whether you want to render something uh, on top of this um, the original project was rendered with the standard renderer so that was a slightly different setup but you get the idea uh, I usually render these as a separate kind of like AOV uh, to be used in comp further down the line but we probably don't need it now at all so um, this is the this is the, 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 the basic setup and and you know when this lens animate uh, including sort of like rendering motion blur and that kind of stuff that creates all sorts of cool stuff around the edges uh, and then you can play with the um, sort of like uh, the light colors to create quick variations if you want or you know change the um, kind of like strength of the light go back to a more minimal and do a complementary color for the center one it's uh, quite strong and then you have a, a, a very different look immediately and then you layer these up with different um, refractions and then you have kind of like this complex object that's somewhat physical and and when the lenses move around it creates these kind of lovely distortions around the edges and and, and all sorts of things like that so i don't want to spend too much time on it because that's an old project i just wanted to show you that something that's fairly simple and straightforward could be utilized uh to create a very complex uh, thing so that's how I would approach something like this and and again you can see if, if, if you are seeing it from a slightly different angle it can also create some super interesting things so another little thing that I wanted to mention within the context of a larger project is um, cinema for is really really good when it comes to uh, being able to create these kind of little helpers or helper tools um, and you can do it in Python or you know Expresso uh, but essentially I think it's it's really important that you start kind of like creating these little shortcuts for yourself because you know you can reuse them on, on other projects as well and um, one of those repetitive tasks that you need to do on certain projects is creating kind of like these turntable renders when you model an asset and and uh, texture it or animate it but you need to send over to the client this kind of little turntable um, and I, I made this um, little I would say asset that helps with that and what it creates is it creates a slate on frame 1000 and then it creates the burn-ins and it gives you control about the environment that the asset in asset is in so you are able to create these uh, quick renders without going into comp and it sort of like speeds up the process somewhat so the way it works is you have um, this kind of 
little knoll where you can put in all the interesting information about your um, studio or name of your facility uh, name your project Maxon project the asset that we are talking about let's call this statue in this case Um, and then you pick a task, which is whether, you know, it could be look dev, it could be design, uh, it could be a test. Uh, let's call this a test for now. Um, you put in the version. It's obviously not as complicated as some of the uh, kind of like version control systems out there like Shotgun and F-Track, but um, it's enough for the purposes of this project. And put in a date. You can choose a few options from what color you want to use for the slate and or whatnot. And then you put your asset, which is this lovely 3D scan of Napoleon in this case, under a null, and that null rotates, and then it has a couple of frames when the environment rotates around it. So it shows every aspect of the model, and the way it looks is something like this. So you have these, uh, the chrome spheres, the grayscale spheres, Macbeth chart, all the burning information, which is quite important. Um, and then you essentially just render this and you are able to send it to the client for approval. Um, and you can control the environment. So this is this sort of like studio lighting setup. You can have a, a sunny setup if you prefer that or if you want to see your asset in that context. Or you, know, you can pick an overcast sky or potentially a night-like scenario and um, you can tweak certain aspects of these you can load the new hdrs if you prefer that and you can control the amount of um, bounce light if you want to or sort of like multiply the intensity of the uh, kind of like uh, the global illumination and change the background color if you want to you want the asset to stick out a little bit more so so yeah there's a there's a few uh, parameters that you can tweak and this is nothing super complex again but again it kind of shows that um it's super important that you can create these little uh things that make your life easier and cinema food is really good in that aspect as well so moving on to um the dark crystal project um i'm going to show you a few things that um were really really um kind of like useful to know when uh, doing that project and um, before we get into the details i just wanted to give you a generic over view of, of how that project went and um you know it's a it's a it's a fantasy kind of like film so the first part of the task was to create all sorts of assets uh mostly this map and all sorts of layouts and and uh, star frames how the characters could uh, line up and and what sort of colors we should use what sort of materials we should use so uh, we utilized redshift to the maximum on that kind of stuff because we used very basic objects uh, we just peppered them around the landscape and and played with um, lighting and, and camera angles and that kind of stuff so when we got to the uh, final production uh, we created roughly about 15 shots 12 shots maybe um, and the most complex was this uh, kind of the, the very last or the one before the last shot of the show which was a, a very long one it was about 600 frames so super complex camera move the camera flies through this uh, landscape um, approaches um, the skexies sort of like pans around them um, they reveal Ogre standing there and then we approach this um lovely beautiful orrery that does a certain move in a certain time um and that needed to line up with a live action shot so um what i did on this shot was uh, first of all we got this beautiful model of the um orrery from uh, dnag and um because it was so complex uh we essentially used the baked in uh, animation and alembic cache essentially and what's super important about it is because the camera hits 
a certain point at a certain time and this kind of arm needs to swing in front of the camera um, it was extremely useful that we could use the um, the anambic read time um, tool essentially uh, in Cinema 4D that gave us a, an opportunity to play with these kind of offsets so we could kind of like fine tune the position of the uh, Orary's arm to match the exact frame where the director wanted that to happen um, and as I said this is you, you can probably see this asset is super complex it has uh, thousands of little parts all of them are animated which was again done by DNEG um, but without converting it into an alambic and being able to use it in cinema uh, sort of like real time that would not have been possible because it was so heavy and so complex so saving stuff into alambic caches is um, is super handy and really really important and i think it's one of the things that everyone sort of just um kind of like uses without uh taking a, a another look but i remember the times before um the lmb caching wasn't as easy as now so basically just a one click solution and, and then you can export your more graph animations and caches uh, and then bring them back and give to another give it give them to another vendor to be used and it was really difficult to do that because um, uh, some other methods to transfer data between applications is not as easy as an big but you know it's it's extremely important for me on, on, a, on a project like this to to be able to do that so I'm eternally grateful for that thing um, so this super complex shot um, again was done in a fairly straightforward way we had a library of rocks and uh, the rocks were kind of like peppered around the um, the place where they needed to be uh, and again using very primitive tools to kind of like uh, randomize them to a certain degree and uh, it's, it's it's nothing difficult it's just sort of like making sure that you have a bit of variation and again going through these kind of uh, options and even just changing the seed uh, could be extremely useful because it, it creates immediately uh, variations on, on, on uh, how uh, setup looks like so I don't want to uh, sort of like dwell on too much uh, on this shot because there's going to be a few more that we're going to go into details with but uh, another part of this shot was an extremely complex particle simulation uh, which needed to be uh, done in X particles and the way it was done is uh, there were these kind of like magical symbols that appeared in the sky and uh, we I tried sort of like emitting particles from splines and and positioned them in a certain way but I, I found this method was the one that was working really well so I rendered these uh, animations of these objects or, or of these shapes in After Effects and brought them in as a texture and um, here's a little tip that's um, you know not everybody knows which I'm quite surprised about but I think it's extremely important to know about it when you bring in a texture to Cinema 4D it looks always kind of like blocky and, 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 and not really really good and, and uh, a very so that the way to deal with that is you go to the editor and go to the texture preview size and instead of using default you use whatever you want to do and then you can see the finer details if you want to see them so you know this is probably I think this is how it comes in and uh, uh, I think internally it uses the full, full thing for uh, you know if rendering purposes and that kind of stuff but in the viewport if you want to see this that's the permitted to to change and these days I think you know using um, 1024 times 1024 is not really a, a big deal so those textures were lined up in this this kind of neat uh, texture sandwich and um, they were used as as the basis to emit particles from um, and uh, 
that meant that I had uh, a complete control about how the original or, or the, 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 the first shape looks like. And then this was combined with all sorts of uh, particle effects and flow fields and, and whatnot. And um, I think I even had this kind of explosion simulation going on that was using, uh, I think, probably a spline somewhere in this this thing um, as a base so it started to emit uh, the, the smoke from that kind of base and that smoke it vectored the particles and I combined that with flow fields and that kind of stuff uh, and then I think what was really important again that everything was cached and, and um, being able to render particles a large amount of particles with redshift in no time is is really important um, and, and that makes these kind of projects much more pleasant and manageable rather than trying to um, sort of like render them in, in, in the traditional ways. I find that particularly useful because with Redshift you can dial in um, sort of like uh, uh, the, the, the focus uh, pretty much like live and, and, and you don't necessarily have to tweak that in post but that's going to be another thing that I'm going to talk about so this is just a rough overview uh, about how um, C40 was used in the dark crystal uh, that was essentially the main tool and we did all sorts of uh, data transfer bringing in data from wetter uh, um, or uh, DNEG that was the main vendor on this project they gave us these models that we had to um, kind of like transfer into our little pipeline um, and we did that all in Cinema 4D. So in the next kind of like chapter I'm going to talk about cameras and camera animations in detail and the reason for that is in this project with the exception of this lovely orrery um, everything else was static and uh, that meant that the camera is the thing that needed to do the heavy lifting with regards to how the story is told through this prologue. So we're gonna go get into those details right now. So moving on with the Dark Crystal project, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some other stuff in detail. And uh, the first thing I'm going to mention is a thing that changed the way I approach um, animations roughly about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first figured out that this thing is is in uh, Cinema 4D. And um, as I mentioned on this project, the heroes were the cameras. Um, nothing else with the exception of the Ori was animated. So it was superbly important that the camera animations are really, really nice. And uh, the director uh, really wanted to kind of like have his input into how the cameras move. So he was using a lot of uh, film terms to describe these kind of things. He, he's he's a, a filmmaker's filmmaker, so he's not necessarily um, describing the, uh, the 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 movements of the cameras uh, as we would do uh, within the context of a of a a three D app. But he was using a lot of uh, things like you know pivot around here and pivot around that point, and and the camera doll is here and tracks there and whatnot. Um, so it was really important for us to have uh, exact control over how the cameras behave. So what I'm going to show you is uh, how this thing that I mentioned is helping me. So um, this is the actual shot that uh, is from that prologue. Uh, it has the model in and it has all the symbols and, and whatnot. And what we are going to do is we are going to create, let's say, uh, camera here that's going to be our starting point so the brief is to animate uh, a camera move from uh, A to B and um, so I create a camera uh, it creates a 36 mil uh, thing straight from the get-go which I usually change to something like 24 when I start uh, these type of animations so uh, we have the camera and let's record a uh, keyframe frame thousand and then get to where we want to be at the end of the shot let's say 
6.b. So let's recall the keyframe like this. And now we have this camera animation where we go from A to B. Now there are a couple of things that you know happen. For example, we want to fly through this symbol, which happens to a certain degree, but it's just by pure accident. And uh, we really don't want to see the ocean too much. We really want to concentrate on the landscape, so we want this uh, rotation to happen earlier. So we can do it in a couple of ways, but the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go, let's say, to frame uh, 70. Open up this camera in the timeline and add a keyframe to the heading. So currently it's here and uh, let's say that we want to face that way that's 170 degrees that's 158 so let's make it 100 and, uh, let's say 65 so we're almost lining up with where that last keyframe is so change this a little bit because we don't want to sort of like bounce back and forth and now we have this camera move it goes from A to B spins around and then moves there Flies through this. Oh, I mean, uh, you know, let's let's change this a little bit to make sure that we hit that point that we want. So let's say we want to be like. That's going to be all right. Cool. So, what happens when this gets approved? at one point but then someone says hey you know what actually I want that rotation to happen much later but everything else should stay the same so you can do a, a couple of things with it and obviously these uh, this animation that we just created is super simple but when there are like dozens of keyframes and they very intricately linked together and you know how it feels when you change something then the whole thing starts to fall apart um, it's not an ideal scenario to be in. So what I do in this in this case, and, and um, in fact most of my camera animations, is uh, create this thing here under the create menu in the timeline, which is called the time track. It's there for a couple of, uh, I think you know, it's I, I used it for a long time. Uh, it was set up in a slightly different way previously. We had to set up a null and uh, add a keyframe to it, and then sort of like turned it into a time track uh, but now it's 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 very easy to add and what it does it creates these two keyframes that kind of like the first frame of your animation and the last frame of your animation and everything that happens there is mapped onto this curve and as you see here it's linear so this is the beginning of your camera animation and this is the end of your camera animation everything that happens in between happens in a linear fashion so when you're halfway there um, that's roughly the halfway point on this curve so why this is useful is you can add this time track to any of the animated channels here so let's add it to you know what? Actually, uh, add it to the, the the pitch. Let's let's add a keyframe here, uh, where we want to pitch up a little bit. Let's make it 170 and um, sorry, 170. And let's say that we want to pitch up to minus nine degrees. So this is the shot, right? It gets approved, you spin around and fly towards this. But then someone says, you know what, I actually like how it spins around, but I want the pitch up to happen much later. But I don't want to change anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to add that time track to the pitch. All right? we see this little thing here. And we just drag the time track into that. And now the time track 
controls the animated pitch track okay so everything that happens here from the perspective of the uh, time track could be controlled from here so on this frame hundred and oh, 1070 sorry if you had a keyframe we just leave it there nothing happens right it's still the same animation but if we sort of like move this keyframe around the pitch up happens much later but everything else all the other animated parameters stay the same and we did not change anything in the original animation that's still at 1070 still the same value but the time track allows us to play with that without destroying the original animation so you know if you want to if you want that to happen much fa uh, earlier you just bring it on here let's say frame 1020 and we want that to happen earlier on so you see we are uh, pitching up quite early on almost at right at the beginning of the shot obviously this looks horrendous but you hopefully get the idea right and then someone sees that it's horrendous and you can you can move it around so the pitch up happens much later or you can put it back to where it was 1070 and it works as a charm so this the value here the percentage controls how much along the way of that time track is being dialed in here so if this is 100 percent, this is zero percent now we are at nine percent uh, but if we put this up then something that happens much later on this track could be brought forward it sounds much more uh, difficult or, or complex than it is but it's extremely useful and and you know you can keep it linear if you want to you can sort of like tweak these curves manipulate the handles and you can add as many time tracks to as many um, channels as you want and it gives you ultimate control over how the camera works and and sometimes I find it that it's always always risky to recreate a camera move if it was once approved or it worked and with this I can sort of like maintain as much from the original animation as it's possible um, but still dial in all those changes that the client requires another really handy camera uh, animation or in fact any animation uh, could be used for that the trick is using the uh, reduced modification curves so this is uh, another shot from the dark crystal superbly complex a uh, lot of tricky camera moves in there um, and by tricky I mean certain things needed to be hit at certain times and uh, it was was not a straightforward task to map this out and when we got to the point of, of we had an, uh, an approved camera move but some parts of it needed to be changed and it wasn't just the timing um, or when to dial in certain keyframes uh, there is this thing that usually helps a bit which is called a reduced modification curves again it's in the timeline go to the F curve menu and then click on reduce modification curve so what it does it creates another curve on top of your uh, animation curve it doesn't destroy it so it's it's uh, you can go back to your original keyframes as you as, as much as you want um, you can choose between a couple of options you can have uh, a move version where the whole thing is moved again based on certain parameters or you can scale it or you can kind of like create this curve that I sort of like had it set up previously and what it does is instead of tweaking your 
very complex curve it creates another curve that kind of lays it out what the original curve does but in a much simpler way and you can sort of like move certain things around it and move certain aspects of it and it kind of like shifts around those keyframes uh, in, in the context of the other keyframes so it's not just one keyframe or a, uh, a selection of keyframes that's being moved around but the entire curve is being influenced by this other curve it's almost like you know an envelope filter you just have this around your original curve and 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 you can manipulate it and 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 bring in certain things and sometimes it's much easier to do with this kind of bits and bobs rather than modifying the original curve as you see this kind of little thing stays here and if i move the keyframes around that's going to go away but that kind of little bump there still remains the same i just move it around when that happens so i find this to be extremely useful and i use this on on most of my projects as well when i have a camera animation that i'm happy with so before we leave the world of the dark crystal behind i wanted to show you one more thing and that's uh sort of like based on this shot which was a very late addition to the tasks that we had to do it was about uh making ogre uh, who's one of the central characters in this little universe uh look younger and it was determined that the way to make her look younger is to have both of her normal eyes open because one of them is sort of like sealed shut um, in the series um, and we could have modeled it we could have uh, spent maybe a day or so to to recreate a version of her face with uh, both eyes properly open but we didn't have time to do that so what we did is a very rough and and, and kind of like fudged version but it, it, it kind of works and, and I wanted to show this to you because sometimes these kind of solutions work especially in the context of a shot it's not something that you would be uh kind of like happily pass on to someone else because this is this is just sort of like a almost like a solution with a duct tape but when you have literally no time to do something like this um, again cinema 4d excels in giving you an option and i think that's one of the greatest things about cinema it's not it's not one way to do things there's there's always a couple of versions that you can come up with and a couple of different approaches and i and i really appreciate it because in this case we just wanted to do uh it in a, in a, in a very rough and and um, kind of like well the easy way let's say that so what we did is we copied some polygons from around her eye roughly this area uh, and there we go and then we flipped it so we had another sort of like eye ball and, 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 and sort of like eyelids that work in a, in a proper way. And if we kind of like superimpose it over the model, it looks like this. So it kind of does the job. It's not something that I would be super proud to show around as a, as a, as a model, but it does the job. And to make sure that, you know, this could be rendered, uh, but what we did is uh, we chugged it, chugged this whole thing into a, a volume builder and uh, created um, SDF kind of like a volume from from these two mesh inputs, uh, her original version and the flipped eye. And obviously we had to go in and, and reduce the voxel size quite significantly to make sure that some of the details uh, we can get back and then we chucked everything into a volume measure and that gave us a really dense but kind of like unified model which lacks most of the details that the original model had but it kind of kind of does the job and you can sort of like go higher than that if you want to and then it's going to bring back some of the those lovely uh, details on the hair and in other areas um, and what we did is we exported this uh, and that was I think that was version 20 that we used on this one and then in another piece of software we kind of like retopologized it and reprojected the high res details 
of the original mesh onto the lower poly version so we get all the um, nice little details but with the proper eye so this uh, second little project I wanted to say a few uh, words about was done during the first couple of weeks of the uh, pandemic um, when we were not allowed to um, go somewhere else but you know we were allowed to uh, take a few walks and I had this idea about what would the Terminator do uh, who tries to blend it blend into uh, the society and you know obviously the character would observe social distancing as well and um, I used that as an excuse for myself to bring out some some gear uh, that I can use for this project like a, a monopod and, and a, a few sort of like attachments and, and that kind of stuff and I um, clamped a few iPhones to it and usually when um, I use photogrammetry which is a technique I used here um, I use sort of like the highest quality camera that I can get and take very uh, intentional photographs of the subjects or the scenes but this time I experimented with using the lowest kind of like quality stuff that I can get my hands on so I decided to use video because that's blurry it's not as good quality and, and just wanted to see how much I can uh, get away with and um, I sort of like imported thousands of frames into the photogrammetry software and and uh, it worked it, it sort of like created these huge point clouds of the area where I was walking um, and obviously these models are exceptionally bad in terms of what you are looking for with regards to photogrammetry but I really uh, thought that this is exactly what I'm looking for on this project because I wanted to see these kind of uh, a Terminator would not really care about details and you know I would not be upset if certain things are missing um, so I exported these point clouds and models uh, from the software and I also exported the camera because when you do the reconstruction it creates a camera per frame essentially so you can see it here and you can export those cameras and then if you line those up or if you sort of like play them sequentially it gives you the uh, exact path that the camera took during this kind of thing now this not exactly lines up with your original footage because the lens distortion is different but it's a really good sort of like uh, way to extract some interesting camera stuff so i brought this into cinema um, laid out the, the things and i started to play with the um, kind of like shaders and all sorts of things things like that and um, another thing what i do with photogrammetry usually is i uh, i bring in the point clouds um, and and you can straight away use those kind of things into your uh, sort of like fui projects um it renders extremely fast and it creates this really interesting kind of look and depending on the um, subject it, you can create entire scenes with that very easily and, and you can manipulate it in a lot of ways you can sort of like uh, clip it and animate that kind of clipping and and sort of like change the colors um, based on certain things sort of like you know based on the height of the object and you can obviously animate these kind of things as well so it's extremely useful and it's a really really good technique to learn um, and when you do it properly you can create photorealistic assets in no time and bring it into C4D or bring it into Unreal or whatever you want to use them um, so another little thing that I did is I replaced one of the cars and the reason for that was that I really wanted to kind of like highlight some edges animate some edges and this is something that I usually do on these kind of projects so I pick a few edges uh, that I think are important or you know I like them uh, visually you could do this in a procedural way of course uh, there are ways around it and I think Cineversity has some some cool tools that help you select uh, edges and, and, and polygons in an interesting uh, procedural way and um, then I create sort of like these um, splines from these edges and uh, scroll to first active which is an incredibly uh, important excuse me incredibly important uh, little kind of like thing that I use all the time and then this spline could be rendered with uh, sketch and tune or redshift or whatever you want it to render with maybe hair you can animate it you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it and then you can use that in your comp as well and um, the reason for that is is 
usually these kind of projects i just render as much as i can all sorts of crazy stuff and then i deal with that in comp i, I make the decisions in comp rather than sort of like wanting to uh wait for the perfect render so i render as much as 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 many things I, as i can uh doesn't really matter whether it's good or, or, or unusable i'll deal with that later another uh, little uh thing from this project is uh i just wanted to show you how i approach this kind of uh, mocap based animations uh which i obviously used on this project um so i created this very basic character in fuse which is probably the laziest way of doing that but that was perfect for my for my project and uh, uploaded the character to mixmo and um attached uh sort of like an interesting walk cycle downloaded it and brought it into cinema now the first thing that i usually do is i create um, a motion layer and uh, then i create sort of like a motion source so immediately kind of like have all the animation in one neat little package and the reason why i do that is because um, i just sort of like eyeballed the speed of the guy walking down the street uh, to match the one in the footage and it's much easier to do this way if i if i can just sort of like um sort of like uh, move this around instead of uh selecting all the keyframes and and doing uh sort of like complex things with them i find this much easier when i deal with this kind of animation and and you layer up all your sources and then you can sort of like mix and match them and blend between them i i, I always use that when i deal with that kind of stuff and then obviously you can line up the next one where this ends and, and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so it's actually, this uh, is just a, a very rough and basic overview of the techniques that I used uh, on this project. Um, and then I spent a bit of time in After Effects and, and um, had a, a, a bit of play with UIs and that kind of stuff, which I don't necessarily have to talk about because uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting talks out there and information out there how to do UI uh, you can do it in cinema you can bring in stuff from Illustrator and animate it uh, in cinema and all sorts of stuff like that but essentially uh, that gives me kind of like a, um, a, a wide array of options that I can play with in comp and and then um, sort of like achieve what I want to do with that little project with that being said this kind of like wraps up my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you very much Maxon uh, for inviting me and uh, giving me time to talk about this kind of stuff. Thank you very much once again. Have a lovely Christmas and take care.